Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Adventures in Crowdsourcing, Identifying and Managing the Back of the Queue. Uh, my name is Milo Parvanoshtiani, and I will help facilitate today's webinar. This webinar is being sponsored by the Federal Highway Administration and hosted by the National Operations Center of Excellence, or NOCO. Uh, as a reminder, and if you don't know this already, at NOCO we provide resources to support the transportation system management and operations community. So on the top right side of your screen, you'll see a pod called Useful Links Box. And from there, you can browse uh, through like uh, our website, previous webinar recordings, and our newsletter. Uh, below that, you can also access the uh, PDFs of today's presentations, um, and also two web links for crowdsourcing for operations. And then uh, all the way on the bottom, we have the question discussion pod where you you'll be using for any comments and questions uh, during the webinar. Um, so all the attendee phones are on listen-only mode by default, but please stay engaged during the webinar and use that uh, question discussion pod uh, for your comments and questions. Uh, the question and answer session will be at the end of the webinar, uh, but uh, please, during the webinar, as the questions come to your mind, um, um, just put them in the question discussion pod and our moderator will, will read out each question one at a time and the presenters will, will answer those questions. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and the recording along with the presentation slides will be available on NOCO website um, and on demand learning section. Um, so that's all I have with the logistics and with that I will hand it over to Paul Jordan, who will be the moderator for today's webinar. Paul. Thank you, Nilo. Appreciate it. Um, welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us for our crowdsourcing um, webinar on identifying manage in the back of the queue. Um, um, for those of you that don't know me, I think which is most of you, um, I'm the Traffic Incident Management Program Manager. And as part of the National Tim Responder Training, uh, protect the queue is a big part of the training, is an important part of the training. We know that's where uh, secondary crashes occur um, for, for, for previous crashes, but we also know it's an, it's an, an, important, uh, an important component of keeping our, um, our customers, the motorists, safe. So um, uh, this, uh, this is a really uh, cross-cutting cross topic for both the TIM community and the operations community. Uh, I, I co-chair this um, this with uh, this, this crowdsourcing effort uh, is not something I usually participate in, um, but we we James Collier and I uh, is in, is in another off, office in the office of operations that deals with uh, basically congestion strategies. We both came up with the idea for an everyday counts initiative for five for crowdsourcing from oper, for operations because we from two different perspectives, because I was hearing so much about uh, advances in, um, in crowdsourcing and how they were helping with the with traffic and identifying in, uh, and responding to traffic incidents. So um, we look come at it from a different perspective, but end of the queue or managing the back of the queue is an is important component uh, of what we we try to do in the TIM world. Um, our speakers today are uh, Ed Cox from the uh, Indiana Department of, of uh, transportation, um, Lee Hahn, uh, and uh, who's a professor at the University of Tennessee, and um, and one of his students, Yang Dang Lu, and I'm I apologize up front because I know I'm probably mispronouncing that, and uh, and then um, my old buddy uh, Brian Purvis uh, from Georgia DOT and AECOM. So um, those are our speakers. I'll say a little bit about those their their bios. You're looking into their bios. Uh, they're they're on the website, I believe, with, with the announcement. But um, I'll, I'll say a little bit about each from what I know about each because I've, I've run into um, each one of the speakers and been very uh, impressed by all the speakers at one time or another. So what? So um, be ready for a poll question that we're going to have after all the speakers have, have done their presentations. And um, those th those are some of the previous topics we have. And we'll post this at the end as well. But, 
what are some of the other crowdsourcing topics that we could help with? Um, we're looking for your input. We're looking to accommodate and doing the best we can we can um, to to uh, help you advance the the state of the practice for uh, crowdsourcing for operations. Uh, May in May twenty we haven't uh, May uh, of twenty twenty we haven't set the date yet. We're going to have a using social media to de detect incidents and inform travelers. So some pretty cool things going on. Um, with that, with the social media and the detection of incidents and travel information that we will be sharing with you, and we'll be announcing that date shortly, I believe. So, um, <clears throat> our overall goal when we're talking crowdsourcing for operations is, is to uh, first uh, increase the number of agencies that, are, that see the advantage and, and use crowdsourcing. Um, so that we can better operate the system. Um, but you know, regardless of where you are as an agency, uh, we are looking to advance the state of the practice. So if you haven't started, let's get started. If you've already, if you're already um, using crowdsourcing, how can we expand on that? Um, so approximately 30, 30 plus states are pursuing. Um, pursuing uh, looking to advance the state of the practice for operations in their in their region so uh, we're very encouraged by that and um, and we look forward to working with folks so um, so why crowdsourcing well we we know that um, when integrated with uh, an agency's already existing technology, you can expand the graphic, um, the geographic coverage and resolution. So, you know, you can't have you can't have ITS equipment everywhere. You can't have cameras. You can't have loop detectors. It, you know, it, it's just not possible. But, um, you know, we, we, in, in locations, especially where you have gaps in rural areas, arterial areas, things like that, you can you can really expand um, what you're able to see and thus manage manage more effectively uh, on the roadways. Um, you can reduce the information time locks from improving, uh, improving um, situational awareness. You know, that's one of the first things I heard in my travels 3DC4 using, uh, using data to improve traffic incident management was, was uh, that folks are actually identifying crashes earlier through crowdsourcing, particularly through ways. Uh, than they're hearing from the um, 911 centers. So um, we, you know, that's you know, the sooner we can detect an incident, the sooner we can we can uh, respond and mitigate it. So uh, that's a big bonus there. If that's a game change, if we can continue in that direction, we want to reduce the uh, you know the the dependence on associated with with the systems. It's expensive to change out a camera, or a loop detector, or other or, or some of the other hardware that we have out there. We can we can really it's more, much more cost to, cost effective way of, of uh, um, being able to be able to handle the full capacity of your system uh, stove pipes jur jurisdictional stove pipes I can tell you <laughs> stove pipes I wouldn't always get the information my role back in Massachusetts the TMC uh, we always are struggling to help you see through that um, but it also helps you implement proactive operation strategies. So uh, we we feel strongly that it's a it's a proven but low cost solution to uh, improving safety and operations of our nation's roads. So um, some of the most common common applications are the travel information. Some folks. Uh, you know, just use it for travel. Just use the crowdsourcing information for travel information. Incident management. I already talked about the early notification is a big piece, but there are other aspects as well, uh, and we're going to talk about that today. Um, the protect the queue, and um, and then the, the agencies are now expanding its use across different areas, such as maintenance, road weather, work zone, and we've and we've we've run into folks uh, all all over the country on that. <clears throat> so. Um, we have um, already had, um, uh, you know, our webinar series, Adventures in Crowdsourcing. This is what we resourced. Uh, I won't read everything to you, but uh, you can see that the um, some of the webinars that we have had already, and the recordings are available in the first uh, in the first um, setup. 
We also um, have been conducting workshops, or we were con conducting workshops until the, the, the COVID-19 hit. Um, and uh, the, But those are available. We hope to continue with those once things have settled down and the, it's safe to go back out into the world and the nation. Uh, we've held, held a couple of the ex successful um, peer exchanges. Uh, one, one, one was on probe data, and, the, um, and, um, and it was very effective, and another was on, um, on uh, Waze applications. So um, uh, we're going to be doing some of those uh, re um, uh, remotely, uh, you know, virtually. If, uh, so if you have an idea or some, something that we can help you with, just let us know about that. And then we, we we offer some technical assistance as well. We have some experts that are uh, um, that are on the contract team that are available to help you sort through some issues and problems. Um, and so I, I offer to you to, to reach out to us if we can if we can be of help in that in that manner as well with technical uh, um, assistance. So there's also um, opportunities with the uh, with funding. Uh, I'll, I'll be honest and say they're not, they're not significant opportunities, but um, each state gets $100,000 per year. The state transportation innovation councils um, distributes, that, distributes that money. Each state has a, uh, has a, stick, a stick council that, that, that uh, you can apply to and get um, up, there's up to $100,000 per state. So uh, many small things, if you need $25,000 or $50,000 for, 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 for something, some activity, you can go to them. Um, the Accelerated Innovation Deployment Demonstration Program is a bigger program, it's um, uh, funding-wise at least, and you're able um, to get up to a million dollars, although most of the requests don't come in that high, um, for something that's um, not you know it's not quite out there and um, you need it like the next step to get from research to actual full implementation the um, it, the program is, um, is is very well defined um, and, and um, each year there's uh, there's funds that are able to be distributed pretty strict so you got to follow the follow the guidelines but um, that is a, a, a again something that's available for innovative type type thinking. So um, as I said, I, I, I co-lead that. Actually, James is the, is the lead. I'm the deputy lead, um, technically. And um, uh, we're uh, always happy to work with you and help in any way we can. So um, our um, first speaker is Mr. Ed Cox, who is um, from uh, in Indiana um, DOT. He uh, when James and I were talking about uh, who should we have on our national team, we have a national team of experts, both uh, lo local and federal, um, that help us, you know, with with some technical expertise. We uh, I had run into some of Ed's um, ad advanced 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 use of technology when we were um, when I was doing my everyday counts for Tim. Um, and and I'd heard about his his great work. So he was the, one of the one of two the first two people that came out of my mouth when we do it, and it's it's been proven successful. Ed has helped us out many times. I thank you again, Ed, for helping us. And um, with that, I'll give everyone a break and let you do the talking from here. Hey, thanks, Paul. I hope everyone can hear me okay. Uh, as Paul said, my name is Ed Cox. I'm with the Indiana Department of Transportation. I've been with MDOT about 28 years, and I'm currently the director of ITS Engineering. Uh, big, long title for me, and I still get to play with all the fun stuff out there in the field. Um, so what I'm going to talk to you today about is kind of the back of queue detection. Um, in the 20 minutes-ish I have, I'm no way I can get real in-depth, so I'll keep it at a high level. But I'll be glad to, uh, if you got any questions offline later, I'll be glad to answer any of them. So where I'll start today is, you know, you talk back of queue in Indiana. In a lot of different areas. Uh, we kind of uh, dipped our toe into it a little bit with the, you know, you can go out and buy the uh, icons, you can get the Burmax systems, have the turnkey systems for your construction zones, and they work just fine. Uh, we still utilize them on occasion at locations. Um, their limitation is, uh, just as with anything, it's hardware cost, and they're only effective for the work zone you're in, and you've got to keep moving hardware around uh, based on where you 
comes to the world of uh, probe data, uh, right now in Indiana, I'm using Enrix, but I'm also working with TopCom. I'll possibly bring them in one of the second, uh, and I'll be glad to tell them why. But occasionally with your probe data, uh, there will be some downtime occasionally, and having some data systems is not a bad thing. We've also done some work with here in the past. So just to let you know, um, all the things I'll talk about apply to all three of these. And in Indiana right now on the research side of it, I was saying was that in Indiana, uh, we've tried a lot of different um, probe data providers, and anything I tell you from here on out will apply to any of those probe data providers. Um, beyond the three I have listed here, we are also um, currently in the experimental stage with some of the OEMs with different auto manufacturers and working with them on direct probe data and what we'll call enhanced probe data. Uh, so that will be, I assume, one of our future uh, discussions. But for this, the smart work zone technology, as I said earlier, you may not have been able to hear me. The only struggle Indiana has had with it is it requires physical movement. It's only good for the areas you can afford to place it in. Uh, you've got to kind of know where your um, backups are going to be at in order to be effective with them. So that's why we really we still utilize them. They still got their place in some of our work zones, but we're really moving more toward the probe data side of the world. Now, when you talk probe data, um, I'm going to start kind of with the basics, not knowing my audience. A um, couple ways you can look at this. Um, most of the companies, and I, the three I have listed there and many more, will provide you with dashboards and services. So you can go out and actually not just buy the probe data, but you can actually get the services to a lot of what I'm showing you. Indiana utilizes just a real-time data feed, and a lot of that just dates back to our history, and I'll, I'll explain why a little bit. Our journey started back in 2011 with a major interstate closure. We had three bridges that go between Indiana and Kentucky. And on a Friday evening rush hour, we lost one of those. Um, so it really kind of made a rush to uh, address issues. So we started in 11, and in 2011, there weren't any dashboards or any support other than just pure raw probe data. So we looked at multiple data sets. We verified the data quality. We built our own tools. Um, through the last nine years, we've seen an increase of the saturation of probes that are out there with all of these companies. Um, and that's something offline. I'd be glad to talk to anybody about there's pros and cons of each one of them have different data sets that bring different things to the table based on your area and the things you're looking for. Um, the bigger thing we saw was improved segmentation of roadways. In 2011, we had segments of roadway were divided up as much as 10 and 15 miles in length, which turned out to be very ineffective in trying to do anything with the back of uh, Q and, det and detecting uh, backups. If you are going to go down the road of just ingesting your own data, what I want to throw out at you really quickly is just be aware. It's not uh, – it, it, Sounds very easy, but there is a lot of data. So Indiana, we've got about 6,600 segments of interstate and about 34,000 segments of non-interstate. Uh, I throw the records per day up there, you know, 59 million records a day, 418 million a week, and 21 billion records a year. We're storing about 3.6 terabytes every year. And I just throw it out there really quickly. If you guys are doing your own IT, just know, you know, storage costs money. If you've got your own IT department, you know, there's just some things to weigh there as to whether you want dashboards or whether you want to um, dive into it yourself. And there's really pros and cons of both. Um, another thing you've got to think about is if you are doing your own is about every six months, the probe data providers will update their segments. And um, that will require a little bit of work on your end to try and make sure that, you know, it adapts into your system. Uh, I lose about a week every six months of uh, my database guy just going through and making sure everything works well. We did test um, all of the probe data coming in, and what we're finding is on all those records, we're not losing more than one minute of data a day on any segment. So that's pretty good. You know, when you look at uh, in a day, we're bringing in 59 million records over almost 40,000 segments, and we're not losing more than one minute on any segment for the most part. So the data verification, just to give you a real quick overview to, to make you feel better with the probe data side of the world. Uh, when we had the closure in southern Indiana, uh, I did something as an engineer I didn't think I would ever be asked to do is I was in a plane or a helicopter almost every day for several weeks. And basically calling shots from the air, we didn't have camera coverage, so I became the cameras. Um, we had officers on the ground feeding me back data on speeds. I could, could compare it live to what I was seeing in the probe data feeds. What we found is pretty accurate. Um, you know, later we got some devices out there and we were able to verify with field devices and we got very comfortable that we had a good data set. The other thing we did, as you can see in the picture to the right, is we loaded a bunch of cell phones in a car with some uh, grad students. And then we chose to put them out on a uh, 
very low volume city street in the late hours of the night and had them drive really slowly. Uh, we wanted to find out, you know, with the real time data, what is our latency? How long does it take to get it from the vehicle or whatever the probe is through the uh, probe data provider system into my system? And what we found, and we've tested this multiple times, is that, see if my animations work, they do not. Um, if you look at the graph on the right, what we found was uh, as we drove along, had our GPS feed going, we dropped our speed, and Enrix was our data source at the time, kept reporting a speed of nearer 50 miles per hour. The distance between here and here is the gap in time. It was about a five-minute window, and we tested this multiple times. Three to five minutes is the window that we saw from the time traffic slows down till we had it live in our system and could actually do things with it. Oh, there we go. There's my animations. And my delay is about five minutes. So what we did in Indiana, this is something we developed about six years ago, maybe seven. Uh, it's not that cutting edge now. Most of the probe data providers can do this for you. But just to understand the logic of what we're doing when we're trying to detect cues and areas using probe data. With our real-time data feed, we just had all these segments build up. And we decided we wrote some really quick code and compared every data segment every minute that it came in and looked for differences in speed. So on here, if you see segment one and segment two, we have a delta speed of two miles an hour, no big deal. But what I was looking for is when we have the segments that drop to like 35, we get a delta of minus 33. Um, again, I've got 6,600 segments. My segment, longest segment now in Indiana is not a mile long, most of which are closer to the half mile. So that gives me a pretty good idea. I don't get a cue much more than a half mile, and I know that I've got an issue going on. With that, this is a web-based tool that we developed. This is a screenshot from it in January of this year. Uh, just to let you know, you know, it's something we still use. Um, I'm going to go through a little bit. If you want the code for it, we're glad to share it. Um, just kind of showing you as an example of things you could build or things you can get dashboards from other, other people. So what we see on here is our Delta Speed tool. On the right-hand side, uh, I put this one up because we can see 2015, we had already started this process. But on the right-hand side is a list of all the Delta Speeds in my entire network. Uh, the largest, it starts the largest at the top and goes to the uh, least at the bottom. Every time one comes up, you'll see a bubble form on the screen right here. And you'll see there's a corresponding location over here. I can click anywhere over here. It'll bring up the location in my state, show me where it's at, and alert me to it. So one of the things in Indiana, we had worked to actually integrate this fully into our system to where it would automatically post messages and do things like that. We have chosen right now to keep the human in the loop. So this is really a tool that our operators use. Uh, and we also have project engineers, state police, and others that use it as well. Eventually, I may integrate into our traffic management system, our TMS software. Uh, but we are in a transition in Indiana to a new software package, so it may take a little while. So if you interpret what we did here, um, as an incident occurs, the bubbles on the screen will be large. Um, they go from yellow to orange to red based on the uh, size of the delta and speed. Over time, over a 15-minute period, they will start shrinking and to show you that you know they've been on the board for a while. You can also click on any one of those. And what I like, um, I'll show you here in just a moment. But here we've got you know slow to stop traffic. We've got a previous backup queue. You can see it's both yellow, which means the delta is smaller, and it is a smaller bubble, so it's been there longer. I have a new large red one here, which shows me that my queue is continuing to grow. These are just things that our operators can, at a glance, take a look at and realize is going on. I can also click on any one of those bubbles, and what I will see is a pop-up show up. And it will show me each of the segments what the speed has been over the last 15 minutes. And the red is the key here, is the delta speed. It will show you what the difference in those has been over the last 15 minutes. So it gives our operator the tool to look at and understand what is going on. Is it growing? Is it shrinking? Should we be doing taking action to deal with it? Uh, another one here, kind of the same thing I was showing you. This is the, the current backup queue. On this one, you can see the delta at the bottom is getting larger, which means I've got a growing backup queue. And on this one, I've got, it's hard to see on there, but I've got a 40-ish mile an hour delta coming up. Uh, a couple things we did on this, some things you may want to think about if you're going to do a homegrown or even if you're going to do a dashboard. We've got our setup. We can filter it by different routes if that's all we care about. If we're just watching a single corridor, we've got construction going on, we want to watch the whole corridor. 
We also have our, our current um, work zones all connected to it as well. So our uh, staff can go in there, click on a specific work zone, and then it will only monitor that work zone and only display deltas for the work zone. The thought was there as a project engineer, I don't really care about the state if I'm uh, working on construction, but this gives me a tool I can pop up just for my job and for my field office or my car. I can watch what's happening in my traffic. Uh, also, we filtered it by state police uh, patrol boundaries. I actually have this running in uh, several 911 centers across the state, and they only monitor their areas to inform troopers of you know, incidents that are occurring, or if they see backups occurring, they can actually send equipment or people out to take a look. Uh, and then we also have it um, NDOT, like many other states, I'm sure, we pay the state police to be in work zones. Uh, when they're in a work zone with no backups, they're just doing, you know, speed enforcement. But once backups occur, we want them out there doing backup queue protection. Um, so this was a way for them to see in a large work zone what type of uh, work they should be doing. Should they be doing enforcement or should they be getting to the other end of the zone to do maybe backup queue detection or backup queue protection? Uh, also note, I'm not going to get into it today. I think some of my peers will. Will Indiana is doing some other backup queue protection initiatives uh, that I'd be glad to share. But I can say uh, we stole some of the ideas from our uh, neighbors to the South Tennessee, who I think will be speaking. Uh, and I appreciate all the things they were willing to share with us over the last year. So uh, what I've showed you so far is the, the tools we use in a traffic management center for live data. I'm going to quickly show you what we call our traffic tickers. Um, I've got just a little small dashboard here that I can go through and click on and choose any route that I want to choose in my state. I can choose any of our districts, which is how we're just divided into six districts across the state. I can choose date ranges, and I can choose um, basically different thresholds of speed congestion. And what I get is a nice heat map. Um, green is good, red and the pinks are bad. Uh, my horizontal axis is time. My vertical axis is mile markers. So this is 465, the loop around Indianapolis. And what I'm tracking here, this happened to be a snowstorm on this one. But what I could see was the impacts that it had to the traffic um, during that storm, great for after action reviews. But it's also great, I'm going to show you in a moment, for work zones that have reoccurring congestion. You can start seeing and overlaying day after day what the work zones look like. A couple of unique things we did for after actions, if you see all the little white dots, those correspond to crashes. Now, they're not good for live because my crashes take about seven days to get into the system, but then they'll auto-populate and you can start looking at, you know, did we have crashes that caused the congestion or did we have um, congestion caused by crashes? I will pop over here. Um, this is more of, a, more of a work zone on the same section of roadway, and you can see um, reoccurring congestion occurring on a daily basis at these locations. The, we also you see the uh, PDOs, uh, property damage only type accidents that we are popping up here. This is a great tool for us helping predict where we'll have queues and having our operators alert, having different types of back queue protection out there. I'm also going to, the next thing we did is because the uh, crashes can only be done about a seven day out, uh, we decided it'd be great for our people in the field who are utilizing this and trying to make decisions in near live time. These can be built to within a few minutes of being live. Uh, we have where they can now click anywhere along here in the horizontal, which is where the mile markers are, we have little lines that are hard to see here that they can click on and it will bring up the nearest camera and the, la and the image that correlates to that time frame. So they can say, oh, I've got a section that's red. I can correlate it to this is what the congestion looked like. Uh, I could click green, and I could see free flow. So these are some of the tools we've built in. I will say from Indiana's uh, standpoint, we have a lot of this in the research side. All this is being used live in our traffic management center, and we are currently working to integrate it into our traffic management software. Uh, the other thing it's really good about doing um, is if you have uh, the crashes that are not construction-related, not reoccurring congestion-related, uh, those dreaded back of queue crashes where somebody runs over the back of a queue or you have a secondary crash. Um, you know, Paul will tell you, you know, and the whole TIM training is, you know, once you have a queue building, you know, the key is how do we prevent the secondaries. What we're finding is you can see we had some reoccurring. This one happened to be a construction zone. We had some reoccurring congestion on Wednesday. On Thursday, we had the same thing starting to build, and what we're finding is we generally – the back of queues don't happen immediately. It's generally a little ways in, so we do get some warning. And then these are great for after action to see, okay, when we did have the crash, you know, the road was closed. Here's the congestion that built behind it. 
even when we opened up, we still had congestion for quite a bit of time coming out. Um, again, we're trying to use it for predictive, you know, when we see the queues, deploy resources, um, get them out there to the field, and try to prevent these crashes like this from happening. Um, with that, I'm going to uh, throw one more caveat in there. The other thing I can say from the probe data side of it, with the um, icons and the Vermac type systems are great for a single work zone. Utilizing probe data, we've been able to do multiple work zones using the same probe data set and getting the information out. You know, the piece we're missing is just the final automation. The other thing we found is that we used to deploy assets about every half mile in our urban areas. The probe data has allowed us to start removing those, and I will be putting out some data here very shortly to Paul and to the group um, about how much Indiana is saving just by being able to eliminate, rather than every half mile, we're deploying devices about um, two between each interchange as opposed to sometimes as many as 10 to 20 between each interchange. With that, I talked kind of fast due to our audio problems. I don't want to short anyone else. I was talking about the 22-minute mark, so there I will uh, sign off and then ask, answer any questions you have at the end and say thank you. Thank you, Ed. Um, great, great presentation. It's it's still amazing how much to me how much, and I've heard the presentation a number of times, um, but how much data you guys are handling on a daily, yearly, and um, basis. It's a uh, it's simply just amazing. So um, our, again, questions at the end, please. We want to make sure we get everyone in. Um, and then Ed has always been really good about working with folks all over this country. He's worked with folks to help them uh, through some of the some of the additional questions. So um, we're going to move on to um, to Dr. Lee Han from University of Tennessee. Um, some of you, um, many of you, may probably know that. Uh, Tennessee DOT and the state police um, are on the cutting edge usually of traffic incident management, technology, one of the ITS, ITS programs led by Brad Fries um, uh, is uh, um, always on looking for the next step. Um, as part of their program has been a priority with protecting the queue. So um, they have been working in partnership with uh, with Dr. Hahn for a number of years and um, on a variety of different projects, but this one is the back of the queue. I had the opportunity of uh, participating in a peer uh, peer-to-peer -peer workshop that we had in um, in Nashville a few months ago, and was very uh, very impressed with his work and his presentation, as as um, as I'm sure you will be as well. So with that, um, Dr. Hahn, if you don't mind taking it from here, and I can let you introduce uh, Young Dong later. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Loud and clear, sir. Oh, great, great. Uh, again, uh, as the slides are loading up, or maybe you can see it. I, I cannot. Uh, hopefully you can. Um, yep, we, we can. We can. My name is Lee Han, and uh, uh, I've been working at uh, UT for some time. And I want to recognize my uh, co-speaker here, uh, Yuan Dong Liu, who is less than one month from getting her uh, PhD degree. And uh, also, uh, Brett Fries, who's uh, uh, a sponsor and uh, collaborating uh, engineer with us uh, from TDA side. And uh, we have learned a lot and uh, been inspired by some of the thoughts he come up uh, with and uh, getting good results. So uh, I actually cannot uh, see the slides. So Yuan Dong, could you advance this for us? Because I don't know which slide we're on right now. Right now, right now we are on the first slide. Okay. And you see here is the overview slide. Okay. Yeah. I actually cannot see it. Um, I don't know if it's a slow on, on my side. But on the overview, um, basically Paul did a great job talking about the importance of uh, protect the queue and. Uh, Several things he talked about. I was thinking, hey, I don't need to talk about half of my uh, presentation there. So uh, I'm glad Brad is actually online. He has his uh, phone muted. 
there are many things he could come in and uh, talk about uh, uh, actual uh, uh, activities and uh, implementations at TDOT. Uh, we are going to focus more on some of the uh, data uh, on the cross-sourcing data side of things. So then since we're going to protect the queue, we're going to know where the queue is, how to find it, and uh, in this particular uh, work presented here, uh, it's uh, crowdsourcing data, primarily uh, ways we're using, and we did some work about how accurate that is. I do want to uh, mention that we have some support, very good support from uh, TDOT and uh, some researchers at UT listed here. So this is a, a little bit busy here, but it's a very uh, basic understanding of a killing situation. Uh, you have a time-space diagram. Uh, time is at the bottom, uh, and time progresses to the right, and the distance of travel is going up this line. I know uh, Tim Latrell is among the, the uh, uh, attendees of this uh, seminar here, and he must be thinking Dr. Hines is pulling out his uh, professor uh, uh, hat here. But basically, we have something happens in the first slide, uh, first uh, uh, that time slice, whether it's an incident or just the beginning of the evening uh, um, rush hour, or maybe there was a, a, a work zone or something. At that point on, as you move toward the right, the queue starting to build. <clears throat> At the front end, that's the front of the queue for many, many years. We were fascinated about front of the queue. We were fascinated about detecting this incident, knowing where it is, when it happened, and uh, wanting to be able to do it in real time. I started working on it in the uh, early uh, 1980s and did a whole bunch of work on that with artificial intelligence type of things. I, I started early when I was five. And then knowing that it's important, but the other side of it is this line goes south, it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, goes down at the back of the queue. That is actually the secondary problems, uh, the incident, uh, accidents or crashes or whatever. That's where you have a problem. And this line going toward the right side and going down is the shock wave going backwards. Now, if you can keep this shock wave going back slowly, you're in a good shape. Now, if it's very steep, then you have a fast traveling backwards shock wave. That could cause a lot of problems. Now, the good incident uh, uh, management or response teams, they would come in and they can control the traffic. They try to open the lanes and re uh, restore the capacity. All these are helping this. Sometimes you have to divert traffic also is to slow that, that queue going backwards. But if it's going backwards and going beyond your urban area, you have monitoring capability, you might have problems. So this is uh, one of the things that we really want to uh, deal with. If you look at the right side, uh, frame five, six, and seven, even though you have restored capacity and queue is uh, going away and you can clean up all the uh, incident uh, location, the queue might still be going backwards. You might still have problem upstream. So it's, it's an issue we want to be uh, uh, conscientious about. So. TDA has started uh, uh, doing uh, work on back of queue for a long time, but one of the triggering events was in the middle of 2013 when uh, there was a, a pile up of nine vehicle, pile up a, a truck, ram into a car and several other vehicles, killing two uh, young uh, people going to the Bonnaroo uh, Festival and a whole bunch of other people get hurt. So they start this campaign and they immediately get a lot of uh, good results, 20, 30% reduction in secondary uh, uh, incidents and all that. At that time, primarily you get uh, the, the information of a queue building up from your help truck or from people calling in primarily, 511 calls, and those 
uh, are, are one way for you to know something's going on. If you have CCTV, live feed, and you're watching, you might be able to see it, but not always. CTA has hundreds and hundreds of those uh, cameras. And you also have uh, real-time detectors, uh, ITS sensors. Every state have them. Now, in 2016, uh, we start getting the waste data, real-time waste data. And that opens up the opportunity for the research, uh, which we sort of highlight in this, uh, in this presentation. And uh, you can start working with, uh, with TDA on this. Uh, NPM RDS primarily in Rex data becomes available uh, um, a couple of years uh, in the past. And in recent years, uh, TDA is uh, trying to get the real time data from them. So we will have more tools to, to do this. So TDA's incident response and the Brad can say a lot more, has uh, many different components, including the uh, traffic management centers at the major urban areas. You can see Nashville on the left hand side and then Knoxville on the right side and the lower part is uh, Chattanooga. And you have a lot of uh, help trucks uh, uh, circling around in those areas to help out and to respond to something they see or someone calling. And uh, uh, if you have uh, uh, any uh, instance along the freeways, which are shown here in the non-urban areas. Uh, the county, county supervisors could get a call, and they would go there and do, protect the queue in those areas. Now, uh, in addition, uh, there are obviously live feed uh, um, cameras. You can observe what's going on and uh, know the exact location and uh, send the right equipment or, or vehicle or, or trucks to help. And uh, also, um, this shows the, the uh, locations of uh, dynamic message signs. You can disseminate information to the uh, people about there's an accident ahead or crash ahead or incident ahead. So you can warn people, but most of this are in fixed locations in urban area. If you are caught somewhere in a rural area or not close to the uh, uh, this uh, um, message signs, you not, may not be in the right place to get the information to avoid uh, the back of queue right in front of you. And this is the, from the TDA SmartWay system. So the protective queue is uh, probably easier to do in the more urban area, but uh, harder in the uh, less equipped uh, rural area. So we started the research using uh, TDAS uh, about eight to 900 uh, uh, ITS detectors. These are uh, fixed location, multi-lane, uh, observing lane. Uh, hey, Dr. Speed, Han. Uh, in, uh, yes. Hey, Dr. Ron. Yeah. This, this is Brad. Sorry, sorry yeah. to interrupt you. I was going to add an, uh, an, another thing. Uh, you, you, re you referenced this a couple of slides back. So yeah. really talking about the Protect the Q program, the, the strength of that program is, is really outside of our help, help trucks and our, our incident response vehicles. The strength really is on, the, on our operations, on our maintenance and, and construction forces that actually mobilize uh, with, with Q trucks and actually help. Uh, provide that that queue detect you know that queue uh, notification uh, at the back of the queue and in advance of queues developing and adjust dynamically as as uh, as the queue changes. So I, I wanted to mention make sure I mentioned that because th they're a big part of this program. Yes, yes. Thank you. Absolutely. That's all. Thank you. In fact, that's why I, I showed that the county uh, borders here. Actually, right. Uh, the county supervisors. They get called and then they go respond in if the incident is within their counties. Am I right? Oh. Mm -hmm. that's, that's that's correct. So we, so we have three super districts, and within those super districts, we also have uh, county maintenance facilities. So yes, they uh, they respond and uh, with their with their resources locally there across NC. Uh, by the way, uh, TDA has a really good training for our Protect the Queue program. I have not gone through that, but uh, I talked to uh, several people gone through that at TDOT Region 1, and uh, I think I should go through that one day because that's very informative. So thank you, Brett. And uh, 
using the RDS, we're trying to, at this point, is to have an alternative way or a parallel way to find the back of queue besides people calling in. So this was our earlier effort uh, using the ITS stations. Uh, uh, this is about uh, some 15 miles, and uh, this is uh, obviously a heat map with some kind of congestion queuing situation, and we're trying to find the back of the queue. And uh, it was very successful, and we're able to identify where you have a major difference in speed. It's not just slow speed, but the speed differential is the problem where you have major crashes. So we're able to identify locally where uh, the, the shock wave is going backwards and try to predict. Not only we try to identify, but we try to predict in real time. That was the goal. And this we're using those uh, stations. But once again, those stations are located. If you look down here at uh, Tennessee map, those are in the major urban areas. Once you go outside of those areas, you don't have the luxury to have those ITS stations. Yet Waze type of, uh, it doesn't have to be Waze, but Waze type of uh, crowdsourcing data actually, and the report, they cover basically major roadways uh, with different densities. So Waze has a speed information we could use, and Waze also has a crowdsourcing use a report telling people, hey, I have a slow moving traffic, I have stand traffic, that kind of thing. You probably all have used something like that. And this effort used that to, to detect and try to verify how good those reports are. Some of those are uh, awash with other reports. Some of those actually right at the boundary of a queue, and those are very useful. So. This is a side-by-side -side comparison of speed side of things. We have uh, uh, TDAS uh, uh, ITS stations, fixed locations on the left-hand side, Thursday on top and the Saturday on the bottom. And on the right, ways uh, speed. And you can see they're very similar. And uh, so we have a lot of uh, confidence in the speed side of things. And here, we're looking at reports by individuals, and we're trying to see how accurate in terms of time and in terms of uh, location. So this is uh, people reporting about crashes uh, compared to people either calling or someone observe and then report later about the incident. And uh, with thousands of uh, different uh, uh, incidents uh, or crashes for this case, Waze, on average, is ahead by six feet. So it's very close to where the accident or crash is reported. And uh, Waze, uh, on average, is 2.2 minutes ahead of the report the, the DOT or police get. So we can know something's happening two minutes, on average, faster, sometimes much uh, faster. And for stopped vehicles, uh, because people don't call uh, as, as early. So sometimes you can be seven to eight minutes earlier in reporting from ways and uh, uh, you're, uh, uh, in terms of distance ahead of that. With this, we have done a lot of work and uh, identified that the ways uh, uh, location and uh, time were very reliable that we're using their uh, um, individual reports of congestion. So this is whole bunch of uh, congestions, about one uh, incident in 2017 or 18. Um, you can see that this is, uh, again, a, a time horizontally. This is the same, uh, same uh, case. On the left-hand side, we have the time goes down from left to right, um, different mile post. You get a whole bunch of uh, reports starting from upper uh, left, around the mile marker 377, we're starting to get reports from ways the same people saying, oh, we have congestion or we have crash. And as time goes on, you have more and more reports coming in. Some of those, those red ones, those are just uh, in the middle of the stream of the traffic jam. But the south border, the border towards the lower side, those are the queue propagating. 
sometimes the Q is slowing down, sometimes it speeds up. On the right hand side, we hope to use this uh, uh, over time and uh, predict where the Q is going, where we need to position the county supervisor, the trucks, or the police to keep uh, uh, um, people from uh, running into the back of the queue. So this being the work uh, of Yuan Dong's, and uh, she did a lot of work on the, uh, about uh, 150 miles of coverage. It was a total of 34 cases of different incidents and cases, and uh, detecting the ITS detected 270 sometimes of uh, the queue location. Or, and the back of Q and the ways it detects slightly over. And they have very comparable results and we, we can trust them. The important thing is ways in general is more than one minute faster than identifying the location of this uh, um, back of Q situation. And that's just detecting. Once we have that, we can also project where the Q is going that will be even earlier in telling the, the county supervisor or whoever the back of the queue, a protected queue vehicle is, telling them where they need to go. They need to back up, they need to be anticipating the queue coming at them at what speed. So that has been our research part of things. I, I know uh, Yuan Dong or, or Brian might have something to add. So uh, go ahead. Nothing to There's add. nothing to add. Then this is the last page. Yeah. Oh, so you lost one. Okay. Yeah. I, I want to. I guess I want to hold on a second. I think I have it on speaker. So I, I want to add that, um, like Dr. Han said, we are in the process of purchasing you know, probe data. So anything to this point that we've done as far as research has been dependent on on the ways crowdsource data, not the not the not the NREX data that, that you purchase. Um, of course, the NPN RDS data is off, obviously not live. That's the, that's the data that everyone gets for free that's uploaded uh, monthly. So, uh, but uh, we are in the process of procuring NREX data live, and, and we'll integrate that into our process. Anton, you have something to add? No, I think you did a great job in explaining the thing. <laughs> She's my student, so she has to say that. I, I see a question about the the T dot protect the Q uh, uh, spec that we have. We yeah, do have yeah. that available, and I will I will send that out uh, for everyone's reference. Yeah. Any other questions? We have to um, we have to wait to the end. But Thank you, Dr. Han, and uh, you didn't give your student any chance to talk. You did all the talking, doctor, um, but that's okay. Uh, it, was, it was a good good presentation, um, and uh, we uh, we do have to keep moving. We um, the next up is um, an old friend of mine, um, Brian Purvis, who we go back many years. Uh, I don't know, 20 years maybe, Brian, something like that. Um, we were. Uh, became friends through the I-95 Corridor Coalition effort, and um, uh, we had uh, a group of us who shared information. Mostly it was me getting information from uh, folks from up and down the region when I was back up in Massachusetts. But Brian has been on the cutting edge of many things, traffic incident management, for a long time. Um, and it's my honor to introduce Brian, uh, who now works for AECOM. I knew him when he was in North Carolina. but. Um, DOT, but uh, he has moved on to the uh, the dark side, as we like to call it. And um, uh, <laughs> but uh, this is his, his um, Mr. Uh, Purvis's um, latest uh, how to keep folks safe uh, initiative. So Brian, all right. Thanks a lot, Paul. So I'm the backside of traffic incident management. Good to know. Um, <laughs> and that's 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 a good segue for uh, for the back of Q. So. Um, so I did want to talk quickly about a couple things that are going on in Georgia, and I'm sure a lot of you are probably doing similar things, but um, back of queue, some of the protection initiatives that we're doing, um, and just, you know, up front, I, 
a lot of stuff that I learned, I saw Tennessee doing this stuff decades ago. So that Protect the Q has been around a long time and very robust. So I appreciate their efforts. But, you know, what can we do in the, in, in the field as operators ourselves, as practitioners? Uh, what can we do with technology? And then what do we do with uh, our partners and how can we make things a little better? So if you can um, share my screen real quick. I'll, I'll, I got a quick video that I want to show. It's really only about a minute. But I think it's a, a good visual um, going back to, to Dr. what you know Dr. Hahn was showing a second ago. Um, this will pretty much show you exactly what we're we're looking at. So hopefully everybody can see this okay. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and start this. So if you look to your left, you'll see a, a typical crash. You had one go in the median, one go off the, the right shoulder into the woods. Um, I'm driving southbound. For full disclosure, Georgia does have a hands-free law, and I'm not using my cell phone. If you look down at the bottom of this screen, you'll see something called Rexing dash cam. So I run a, a dash cam so I can record things all the time and, and use them for, for studies. But really good traffic control at this, at this incident scene. You'll see law enforcement in the front, uh, the tow truck behind them. So additional resources went to the beginning of the uh, or downstream of the incident. You had the incident running off the, the shoulder. The occupant in the median was already out and, and sustained um, no injury, so it's a good situation. Um, behind the scene, you'll see a block with a fire truck. You'll see a little blue light here where you had law enforcement behind them, kind of a blocking uh, vehicle um, angle to give people some warning. Um, I'll go a little bit further in here. That truck that you see right there with the message board up is a, a GDOT Champ truck. So in Metro Atlanta, you have the big, um, like, international terrorist-style trucks. Um, ours are F-250, so we're a little bit smaller. Uh, you can see the operator is putting out traffic control and directing traffic away from the incident scene from uh, lane two to lane one or to the left lane. So he's got his message board up, his strobes. So just really quickly, I'm going to let this run. You can see your typical backup. Um, look at the traffic going southbound. This is rural interstate, I-85, um, south of Atlanta. I'm heading to a meeting. And, you know, obviously traffic volumes are extremely low. Uh, this is back in February before the, the shutdowns. So not a lot of traffic, you know, obviously raining conditions. Um, healthy backup, obviously these folks can't see the incident scene. They can't see the responders' lights at the scenes. So, you know, back to the earlier discussions, speed differential out here, you've got a 70-mile-an-hour facility, somebody not paying attention, and it's raining, and you've got slick roadways. Obviously, you could have a pretty major secondary crash in this situation. So one of the things we do when we deploy somebody to a scene is we immediately send another operator upstream for advance warning. And that's what you'll see right here. Um, just below my windshield wiper. So there's another operator that's letting motorists know in free flow condition before they ever see the backup that there's a crash ahead, uh, prepare to stop or right lane close. So they've already got information up that far in advance. So we'll switch back over, stop sharing. So if we can go back to the presentation. Thank you. That worked better than I thought. So the age-old question, and I guess with Easter coming this week and happy early Easter to everybody, um, the age-old question, which comes first, the chicken or the egg? Do you go and protect the scene or do you protect the queue and the, or the backup? So we, we thought about this and pondered back and forth. You know, obviously, if you're the first one to run up on an incident scene, you have to protect that scene before you can respond. You need to block. You need to protect yourself as a responder. You know, we stress to everybody that's always our first priority. If you're blocking for others, obviously you're needed at the scene. If you're providing temporary traffic control, um, if you're needed for coordination, or if you're needed for, for traffic clearance. So obviously your tow, tow companies, uh, your safety service patrols, they're going to the scene for a coordination standpoint, plus to see if they can go ahead and clear it so there is no queue to even deal with. So when do we go to the protecting the queue, it really shouldn't be protect the scene or it should be and protect the queue. 
you should, um, obviously, if you're called by others, that means somebody's already at the scene. We need to start working with our 911 and our dispatchers to find out, do you have that scene blocked? Is it protected? And would we be better served as a, in, in our case, a safety service patrol operator um, protecting the, the, the backup? Obviously, if somebody's at the scene and they see traffic slowing, that's another situation where they need to be calling somebody to protect the queue, to protect the queue that's generating. Um, the thing that we teach our first responders is if you can't see the end of that backup, then they can't see you. I don't care how good your lights are, once that last headlight you know, disappears around a curve or into the, um, the abyss, then you know you've got a problem, um, especially on interstates and high-speed facilities where that speed differential is deadly. Um, your dispatchers and 911 people that are sitting safely in, a, in an office uh, dealing with all the calls need to start looking at the maps. Um, but there's pretty robust information out there with Google Maps. Um, a lot of uh, state's 511 systems have information where you can show the backup. And obviously, if you think there's a big speed differential, um, you need to have somebody back at the, the backup managing these. So remember, it's not a protect the scene or. We've got to change that mindset and say protect the scene and protect the queue. Um, it's the, the incident that we're managing is not just at the scene. It's to the last motorist. And we've, we've used the term uh, for fire lane plus one response. I'd like to kind of get it into everybody's vernacular that it's motorist plus one. So you're protecting that last motorist in the backup plus one, plus the next motorist that's coming up on you. So a couple things you can do from a technology standpoint. I mean, obviously, we can protect the queue by doing it manually by having somebody in advance, like I showed on the video. If you've got a, a 511 system, um, Waze, I've heard a lot about Waze. I'll, I'll tell you how we use it here um, on our program in Georgia and then some other pilot projects we're currently working on. So this is a, just a quick snapshot of Georgia's 511 uh, GA system. Uh, they've done a, a good job with it. They're currently upgrading it. Um, they have integrated Waze, which is a huge benefit. Um, but when you're teaching first responders how to use this, I mean, basically, you can look here, just like on that, that video, I was heading southbound, going in the northbound direction, you see where the, the red begins and where it ends. Well, that tells you if traffic is going this direction, where that red starts is where that incident is. So that gets us a lot better as, as far as how do we get responders to that scene. Where it turns yellow, that's where the speed differential is really occurring, where people are slowing down. Where we've got to work is on that, that green area, where they're still at free flow condition and having to transition. So, you know, this is just one of my training slides that I use across the state to let people know that this can be law enforcement, another fire truck, um, a safety service patrol, anybody that you've got. Um, you know, Tennessee DOT could use their maintenance folks in rural, in rural Tennessee. Um, you know, this is how you position your vehicles appropriately to, to respond to the scene quickly and to get um, in advance of that queue and be able to monitor it and let you know where things are. In addition, if you've got cameras, if you've got message boards, um, the nice thing about 511GA.org is it's a free download for Apple and, and Android platforms. So, you know, we actually pull it up and show it in training. You can download this. It's free. There's no special access. And you can validate things if you're at the scene. Hey, look, there's a message board back there that may be reading uh, for CHAMP roadside assistance call 511 and you're sitting there exposed at a crash scene. So you can validate things and call back to 911 and get that information updated. So I mentioned that Waze was integrated into this system. Um, you know, a lot of folks don't like Waze from the, the law enforcement industry. Um, I'm trying to turn that, that attitude around, but, you know, there's a, in the middle of the screen, you'll see a little, share, uh, a little law enforcement face with a hat on it. Um, so they're, they're showing this information, but the traveling public is telling us what's out there. So my message is, you know, law enforcement, you don't like it when they tell you there's a hidden police trap. And I understand from an enforcement standpoint, you're, you're trying to capture people and enforce the roads. 
But when you get out on the interstates or you're actually responding in the travel lanes and you're in an, in an exposed position, this is a great opportunity for fire, rescue, law enforcement, towing, um, EMS, DOT, everybody to pull up. If, if you're in a protected location, go ahead and pull your phone out or have somebody that's tech savvy at that scene be in charge of putting that into ways. Um, you're telling them exactly where you're located. And we tell fire, if you've got somebody riding in the right seat and they're approaching, go ahead and have it queued up so as soon as you jump out, you can hit the button and post that there's a crash at that location. Um, law enforcement, when they show up, they can say, put their dot on there and say, I'm sitting right here. Law enforcement detected at this location. Um, we've been telling people through traffic incident management meetings, you know, if you'll come to my meeting, I'll give you a free message board. All you have to do is show up so we can talk about it. And then we pull the bait and switch and say, here's ways, here's your free message board to use to the public. Um, they, that hasn't blown up in my face yet, so I'm going to continue doing it. Some of the um, advanced initiatives we're doing with uh, some pilot projects is, you know, I've got fleet tracking through Verizon Network Fleet on all of my trucks, so I can see where they're at. But the, the traveling public never knows exactly where they're at, where they're pulled over. We, we've put out message boards. We've put crash investigation sites. But they, they don't follow suit, and they don't tell us exactly where they're located. So um, I think the third dot down, I say carbine. That is something we partnered with uh, 911 centers and some of our rural traffic incident management teams and asked them what they're doing and found this little app that your dispatch centers can basically um, if, if somebody breaks down and they call 911 or 511 in our state now, basically the dispatcher will say, you know, I need to get your location. I'm going to push something to your cell phone, and all you have to do is acknowledge it, and all it sends me back is your X, Y, and Z coordinate of where you're located or your Latin long. And within about five meters um, accuracy, we can get that information and get straight to the scene. The quicker the response, the quicker the clearance, the minimizing of the queue. Um, one of the other things we've, we've piloted is 360 NS is the company. Um, they're using icon technology and basically pushing information, uh, which I'm showing right here on the on the right of the slide. That little yellow post is basically just a piece of fiberglass that drops down into a traffic cone. The technology is in the little puck. It's a solar powered puck that you can turn on and activate and Pretty much when you put it out in a construction zone in one of the cones, um, you can post a canned message that says construction ahead, uh, merge left, prepare to stop, whatever your, your standard message is. They can program it in ways for you. So when anybody gets about two miles in advance of that location, if they've got ways running, it auto-populates it. You don't have to do any manual input. So the hero units and the, the GDOT champ units rural um, piloted this, and we saw some pretty good responses. Uh, not real technical, but you know, we started um, lane closures without it, and then put the uh, the puck on, and we actually saw people moving over. Did the same thing on the the right shoulder, doing motorist assist and picking up debris, and we did see better compliance um, when this turned on. But basically, all it's doing is two miles in advance, it popped up for us and said, "G dot champ ahead, use caution." Um, then by the time they saw us, they knew that something was out there. They may not even know what CHAMP is, but, you know, it gave them a couple minutes warning, so they got out of their phones, they got their, their face back looking in the right direction. Um, the last thing, and I called it reverse 911, but another neat project that I think everybody may look, look to in the future is uh, another big partner is FEMA, uh, Federal Emergency Management. Um, they've got something called IPAWS. Integrated Public Alert and Warning System. Um, it, it's, a, it's a really neat system. You see it for AMBER alerts. Uh, you're now seeing your phones pop up with uh, weather alerts um, or, or other imminent danger type events. Um, what Georgia is doing is taking it to the next level. And so AMBER alert is telling the public to look for one individual. If you invert it and you know that you've got traffic crashes, um, basically, one individual, which would be DOT, partners with FEMA, gets the message and pushes it um, through a, a, a buffered area. So they draw the area on the map, and that message auto-populates everybody's phone, cell phone, within that region. 
So if you had um, a hazmat spill, a bridge collapse, God forbid, any major incident that's going to be long-term or has a massive backup, you could actually draw the circle on the map and then push information to anybody coming up in that circle. So if you had a backup, say, from mile marker 10 you know, back to 11, you would want to tell people from 11 back to however far, maybe, maybe 5, I mean, sorry, maybe 15, in advance of that or upstream of it that, hey, you're about to run into backup traffic or you need to detour or whatever. So there's some cutting-edge technology that should help us. And uh, back to the 360 pilot, the thing I really like about that is our truck is advance warning, but it's only as far as you can physically see. Throwing that additional two miles out there is advance warning for our advance warning. So you're putting additional layers of protection for your, your staff out there. So those were just some things I wanted to kind of run through with everybody. The last thing I'm going to mention, and I'll turn it back over, is uh, you know, working with others. Develop your 10 teams everywhere across the state, including rural parts, uh, where you do have low expectation for stop and go traffic and, and higher speed differentials when things happen. Um, train on protecting the queue. I was going to mention you know, Tennessee's training. I've, I've, I've looked at that for decades now. I mean, that's been really good training. Um, track your secondary crashes and report those monthly. If you're doing a good job with your, your queue detection, you should be seeing the benefits of that. Um, train, train, train. Um, Sharp 2 training. In the state of Georgia, we have now trained um, almost 19,000 responders. Uh, we're at 65%. Over half of those have trained online. Um, so there are some, some local places you can get that. And I want to throw a shout out that right now is a good time for doing that because if you got responders sheltering in place, send out a blast email to them and say, hey, if you haven't had Sharp 2 training and your classes are canceled, you can still get it. Take the online version and we'll clean up and add the state-specific stuff later. And then beg, borrow, and steal. That's the purpose of these calls. Um, I'm on them just about every month if I can physically be on them. Uh, continue to reach out to other states and look what they're doing. And uh, if you need anything from, from myself or the state of Georgia, um, there is my contact information and uh, Chad Hendon, who is the uh, champ operator on the GDOT side. So with that, uh, I'll turn it back over, Paul. Thank you, guys, and happy Easter. Thank you, Brian. As always, nice job. I do like that last bullet. Um, we've been talking about stealing uh, in the Tim community for a long, long time, and uh, that's um, really helped has helped us uh, helped us move things forward um, many times. So, with that, I wanted to get to some of the questions here. Although my chatbot has disappeared, <laughs> um, uh, um, so here's oh, one. Um, also, just a reminder that we also did want to do that poll. Oh yeah, okay. Let's let's do the poll then. Let's do the poll. That's right. That's right. So, um, on the on the right there, you can uh, now it's in front of you. Um, what topics would you like to see in the future installments of the crowdsourcing webinar series? Is there anything else up there that um, that we're missing? Any thoughts? Um, just type your answer there, and um, and uh, it will help us accommodate. Um, Accommodate the interests that are out there relative to crowdsourcing for operations. You know, we we have some. Um, we've recently I've heard a couple of good presentations. One was just a one-on-one -on -one, uh, with the traffic control, traffic signal control. There's some really cool things going on there. Um, work zone, mobility. Um, but traffic signal uh, timing, there's, there's some, in fact, we we, um, we had planned on doing one, uh, I think the one in May, we might, um, uh, there was some, it's, it's sort of one of the presentations at least is, is sort of an integration of the, um, of um, uh, social media, and um, and um, uh, other sources for the tra traffic signal control. So, um, digital alerting. Okay. Well, digital alerting um, 
yeah, that's that's something that I don't know that we have a lot of information on. And I know this hassle, or I know Corey, I know, I know it's out there, I know. Um, but uh, we'll we'll look for some information on that. Okay, so let's get to the questions. Keep typing if you'd like. If there are any more ideas, keep type typing. I will be happy to. Um, in work zones, well, we, yeah, I guess we need to do a little bit more on work zones. I don't know that we've been, we've done that. So, um, okay, so we have your input. We appreciate it. We'll uh, we'll have the team consider, um, and uh, we thank you for your input. We do want to address your needs. So, um, let's see where these questions start. Oh, Hold on for a second, I'm back. I'm sorry. I just meant I just wanted to make sure all the speakers are on because I got cut off for a second, but it seems like you guys are all on. Okay. Um. Does anyone have any information on uh, the, how important a latency is for queue management in, uh, in construction zone alerts? I don't know. Uh, is latency a high priority item? Does anyone on the panel want to take that one? Um, this is Ed. Um, I've made a comment about the latency. We did some checking of uh, NRIX data. We were also looking at TomTom data and some of the other uh, uh, OEM data. and. It is important. Um, I can say that we found the three to five minute window is where we're at on most of those. And most of our crashes, you know, we've been tracking all of our back acute crashes for several years now. Um, it's not been a problem. We've still been able to detect it before uh, secondary crashes and, you know, before the initial crash in a queue due to construction zone. So it hasn't been a problem for us, but me as a traffic guy, I do want to know what the latency is to know what I'm getting. Uh, from those, so it was an important thing for me to put my management at rest on how quickly the data was getting from the field to us. Okay, Ed, thanks. That's a good answer. Uh, another question: Has there been any studies on uh, on in introducing a, um, a detour upstream to reduce length of queue? Um, I'm just going to say I don't know of any studies on that. Um, anybody else on the panel are familiar with any kind of studies? I think typically the you know the the the, the detours you know you you put them in as you as you can where it makes sense where it makes sense. It just it isn't a, a you know I don't think there's any um, hard and fast rule for that. But um, anyone else want to chime in on that? Uh, yes, uh, we did some work on uh, incident management uh, years ago, and uh, sometimes uh, uh, researchers uh, tend to just throw detour as a uh, as a way of taking away some traffic. But really, you cannot do that for many uh, locations, especially for some of the cases you have large trucks that would not be able to detour for certain locales. So uh, it, uh, for construction. Work zone, you can plan it well, but for uh, incident that pops up, uh, it's a lot harder to manage that and uh, do it right. Sometimes you can cause more harm uh, on the surface street. Yeah, I don't, I don't know that you're actually protecting the queue that way either. There's a, still going to yeah. be a queue there, um, and you're, you're right. So you have to be very careful when you're establishing detours, but I don't know about re reducing the queue if that really... Um, there's still going to be an end of queue. Next, next question: um, Has there been a, any studies on messaging into the information, informing the motorists of the end of the queue? Um, something more proactive than relying on us motorists to use ways. Um, well, I think that's what we're talking about today: is being proactive. Um, uh, you know, with not only just ways, but with Ed's 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 approach and Brian's approach, and um, I, I know we can't depend on ways, but um, we also can't depend on DMS ports. That is just not the way to get the information to the motorist. You need to get some sort of notification as that 
Q as that Q um, expands, as the end of the Q moves, it moves, it constant, constantly moves, right? You need to protect that end of, end of the Q because there's not enough DMS boards and there's not, and, and motorists typically, um, you know, it, it remains to be seen how much they really pay attention to that DMS board and it may not be positioned properly to help. Um, so that's why getting that vehicle like Brian does, getting that vehicle, those vehicles to, to continuously monitor that end and, 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 and get at the end of the queue and want people before the end of the queue is the only way to go. Um, anyone else have any thoughts on that one? Question? Yeah, Paul, I agree with you. Uh, just like Brett said, that the whole idea here is actually trying to deal with uh, uh, situations outside the urban area where you are not likely to have a, a DMS uh, serendipitously uh, right at the right place uh, and uh, uh, sometimes people don't use ways uh, I think there's a movement that Google map which has a lot more people using is uh, showing uh, uh, information about crash and uh, even police they have some in-house politics uh, rivalry with uh, with ways but it seems like a, a Google map which has more people using might start giving you information about this so Potential, I see uh, Federal Highway or, or, or DOTs, uh, uh, state DOTs, partner with uh, Google Map and provide that kind of information. So uh, take advantage of a lot of people looking at that. Okay, thanks, Dr. Han. Uh, is there any, is there a specific algorithm that was used to detect significant speed differentials? Um, how can one get access to the speed? way speed data. Anyone want to take that? Yes, uh, uh, that's actually related to our work since we're using okay. Waze. Uh, um, yeah. You go through the uh, Waze has a uh, uh, connected system uh, program, which they changed the name recently, but it's the same thing. And yeah. they prefer each state has one contact, so usually it's a state DOT. And through that, you sign the agreement and you can get the data. And uh, uh, in terms of uh, identifying the speed, in that speed information, you don't use the, uh, some cl clustering uh, algorithm, and you can use the different tools to identify the boundary. So the one we presented was using a uh, clustering uh, algorithm. If you want more information, Yuan Dong is, uh, is fixing to get that published, so she can send you uh, some uh, papers, uh, things that uh, I, I barely understand. Yeah, Brad actually typed uh, something in along those lines before he left. Uh, yeah, he says okay. you can get access to, to the Connected Citizens program. If you're not, if you folks aren't familiar with that program, it's a it's a good program. Just go online, and uh, there are many many members, and they um, um, they provide input to the to the ways program, um, but also they you know you you can you can get there's a whole not other platform you can have access to once you remember their program that allows you to see more and you know what what the what the um, what the inputs are to the system to the way system so it's pretty it's pretty interesting uh, thing so um, have you have um, I guess maybe this is for Ed probably would know uh, are there, has there, has there, have anyone analyzed the back of Q data from NREX? Has anyone done that? The, uh, you're talking about, I assume, the dashboard that they put out? Uh, that's probably what is meant by that. So, yes, we have looked at that. Um, actually, so one of the things we do with all of our pro data providers we work with is um, try to work with them to take some of the tools we develop and turn them into products so other people can see them. And we did analyze their back of queue at the time it was developed. It's been a while since we did this. It was running very close to what we were seeing in our algorithm of just pulling the adjacent segments and running at about the same speed we were. So and that dates back. They started work on that probably six years ago. So it's it's been advanced a little bit since then. But my analysis is probably five years old that we looked at. Okay. Thanks, Ed. Well, I see there are more questions in the chat pod, but we do want to end uh, on time, respecting people's time. And um, 
the fact that I have to get to another meeting, but um, as well as I'm sure others do. Um, so any of these other questions that we didn't get to, if you want to uh, reach out to us, send us a, a message, and we'll, we'll see if we can take a look and, and get back to you. But um, uh, feel free to email any of the any of the presenters. I know we'd be happy to hear from um, from you. And um, and you know, I just want to. Thank you for your participation today and, um, and the, all the work that you're doing out there to help keep in our, um, our roadways safer with efforts mm -hmm. like these. And, um, and just a, you know, on a, a note about the, the COVID-19, please be safe and hope your family is safe and, uh, and keep up your good work. We want to continue with our work so that when everything is back to normal, we hit the, we hit the the, the ground running. So thank you again, everybody, and, uh, and be safe, and uh, we'll talk to you on the next webinar. Thank you.